Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. I know there's a lot of places you could be. It's the RuPaul's Drag Race finale, so it's, I know it's a sacrifice for many of us uh, to be out tonight. Uh, for what I hope is a really, uh, hopefully a lively discussion about HIV and the criminal law. Um, and it's a particularly great honor for me to be here speaking at Muskegon Community College because as you'll see, the story of the book um, in part really starts here in um, Muskegon. So I want to start with a couple of stories that I help, I think, uh, illustrate some of the key issues of the book. And then in the q and I'm happy to sort of get pulled in any direction you want to go and things you're interested in or following up on. Um, definitely, uh, let's go down those rabbit holes. So the first story I want to tell is about a woman um, prosecuted in Michigan under their felony HIV disclosure law. Her name was Brenda. She was a 32-year-old white woman living right here in Muskegon. She had an IQ of 72, which if you know anything about IQs, is just barely above the threshold of being diagnosed as having a developmental disability. Uh, she contracted HIV very early in the epidemic, and authorities, uh, local authorities here in Muskegon viewed her as a thorn in their side for many years. When they found out she was sexually active in 1992, in fact, they quarantined her, as you can see this story illustrates. And she's really one of the only people, uh, very few people, to be quarantined for HIV in the United States. Brenda was rebellious, to say the least. She was appointed a legal guardian when she was quarantined and placed into adult foster care because she was not deemed competent to take care of herself. She eventually grew very frustrated with that foster care living situation. And she called her legal guardian one day and begged him and said, please move me out of this foster care. Let me live on my own independently. Her legal guardian obliged, and what did he do? He didn't move her into an apartment building or somewhere on her own stable housing. He moved her into a rundown motel in town, notorious for drug use and prostitution. So perhaps not surprisingly, within 48 hours, Brenda calls again. This time, she begs the legal guardian to put her back in the foster care home. She told him that she had had sex with a man. She claims that the man knew of her HIV status because, as you can see, it was no mystery in town that, this, uh, that Brenda was living with HIV. She was plastered all over the local newspapers, state newspapers, national newspapers at the time. Uh, she says that they discussed that newspaper coverage explicitly, um, but nonetheless, her legal guardian called the police and uh, they arrested Brenda on felony charges that she had had sex with a man but did not disclose her HIV status. So like many states around the country, that failure to disclose is the crime. You don't need to show that there was any risk of transmission or that transmission actually occurred. Uh, you also don't need to prove malicious intent. So sometimes you'll hear these laws referred to as HIV transmission laws, and that is an incorrect uh, way to refer to them. They, are, they have nothing to do with transmission. Any sexual penetration under Michigan law, which is extremely broadly defined, as you'll hear about in a second, is forbidden under the state statute. So initially, Brenda's neighbor, who she had had sex with, did not want to testify against her. But he changed his tune pretty quickly after police arrested him on several outstanding parking tickets and leveraged that arrest to secure his testimony against Brenda. In exchange for testifying, right, some of the, the tickets were dropped. He did not test positive for HIV, nor was he likely to. So uh, just sort of play a game that I play with my students sometimes. So let's just imagine for a second that an HIV positive woman has vaginal intercourse one time with an HIV negative man, right? So a woman living with HIV has sex without a condom one time with a man who does not have HIV. So what do we think the probability of transmission is in that one time situation? Uh, do we think it's, uh, raise your hand if, if you think it's 100%. Okay, a couple hands for 150 percent, half, half, maybe 20 percent, a couple more, 10, 
it's actually less than 1%. It would be about 1 in 2,000 would be the probability of transmission. So, um, yes? Is it because, is it more of a, a skin on skin or a, more of a blood? That would it is actually transmitted, but it's easier to transmit from a man to a woman than from a woman to a man. Um, and different factors can affect that. And we can okay. sort of get into the details of that in the Q&A. But at, at sort of the outset, you know, the probability, even at that time, we had data to show that that, uh, that he was not likely to contract HIV. But again, under the law, that does not matter. So public health authorities have never considered HIV to be a highly contagious disease compared to influenza, for example, or smallpox. Um, those are much more easily transmitted. Even syphilis or gonorrhea, other sexually transmitted infections, much easier to transmit than HIV. So nonetheless, despite this low risk, at trial, prosecutors describe Brenda as selfish and a potential killer, calling her, quote, a carrier of death. She was found guilty by a jury and sentenced to 32 months in prison. At sentencing, the judge scolded her, Brenda, for, quote, carrying a deadly weapon, her HIV, and going around, quote, killing people. So I find when I talk to people about my work uh, around the country, most people don't imagine Brenda as the typical defendant in these cases. They imagine someone far scarier, a kind of boogeyman character, you know, lurking in the shadows, who's out there maliciously trying to expose and infect other people with HIV. In real life, those boogeymen are very few and far between. Most defendants engaged in low or no risk sexual practices. Many used a condom. And still many others had what is known as an undetectable viral load. Is anyone familiar with the concept of having an undetectable viral load? A couple people, great. OK, so it, this, this word is starting to sort of get out there um, in popular parlance. So when you first contract HIV, the virus reproduces uh, sort of um, many, many times in your body. You can have up to a million copies of the virus per milliliter of blood in that first early stage of infection. Before 1996, there wasn't much that doctors could do to treat that viral infection. But scientists developed effective treatment in 1996 that revolutionized HIV medicine. Illustrated here, you can see the deaths illustrated with the blue circles, uh, the blue diamonds, I'm sorry, uh, you know, it goes dramatically down in 1996. And that's because of the introduction in treatment. So overnight, really overnight, if you talk to people who were living at the time with HIV, it really was one day they were dying from a terminal illness, the next day they were uh, managing a chronic disease and expected to live long and healthy lives. So that you, know, you can't understate the sort of dramatic difference between 1995 and 1997. Today, people diagnosed as HIV positive can take a pill a day few side effects that will allow them to leave a full and complete and healthy life. But the impact of treatment went far beyond just affecting the lives of people living with the disease. And that's obviously most important here. That's the most important outcome of treatment. But scientists also discovered that it reduces and even eliminates the risk of sexually transmitting the disease to partners. So that's because treatment interrupts the life cycle. It stops the virus from reproducing. It can't reproduce in your body. You don't get a million copies of, of the virus in your blood when you're on treatment. In fact, it's reduced to so low levels that we can't actually find it when we go looking for the virus. So that's what we mean by undetectable, that if we go looking for the virus in your blood, we cannot find it. We cannot measure the number of copies in your blood because it is so low. That's what having an undetectable viral load um, means. So studies now show that people living with HIV who are on treatment and have achieved an undetectable viral load cannot, full stop, transmit the disease. So how do we know this, right? How do social scientists show this to be the case? We can't randomly expose some people to HIV, right? That's not sort of how it works. But we can track couples where one partner's positive and one partner's negative who are having sex on their own volition, right? You're not forcing them to do something they don't want to do. 
They're having sex, they're out in the world, and we can track them over time and see how many times is HIV transmitted between partners. And that's what the partner study did. So we've, uh, the partner study tracked over 1,000 couples, some straight, some gay, in which one partner was HIV positive and the other negative. In order to participate in the study, couples had to be having sex without condoms. And the positive partner had to have an undetectable viral load. So after an estimated 58,000 condomless sexual encounters, how many transmissions did scientists observe between partners? Zero. Not a single transmission within couples. And this science, again, has kind of revolutionized HIV treatment and management and led advocates to declare that, quote, undetectable equals unintransmittable. At least at first glance, this science, this idea that HIV is no longer infectious if you're on treatment, would seem to radically undermine the idea of punishing people for not disclosing their status to their partners. If you can't transmit the disease, what's the ethical duty to disclose? Alas, as I show in the book, so far this scientific progress has not translated in American courtrooms. Courts routinely punish people living with HIV, even when there was no plausible risk of transmission. So some people say, well, you know, any risk is too much risk, right? That they, we get caught up in these, these low probabilities. But let's take the case of Melissa, also in Michigan, down in Cass County, 2009. She was arrested after the club she danced at, she was a stripper, was raided for drugs. They arrested her on drug charges. She disclosed she had HIV. They threw the book at her. Remember, right, that Michigan law the felony statute here in Michigan requires disclosure of an HIV status before any quote-unquote sexual penetration, which the law defines as uh, including, quote, any intrusion, however slight, of any part of a person's body or object into another person's genital or anal openings. So when I gave this talk to a group of med students out in Detroit, one of them asked if that definition might conceivably include a pelvic exam. Now, I think that student met that question as a joke, right? But Melissa's case reveals that concern to be quite sensible. Melissa was not accused of having sex with her client. But the media reports were very vague at the time as to what exactly transpired. So when I finally got my hands on the court transcripts, which is the data I use to analyze these cases, I understood why. Here is an exchange that actually happened in a Michigan courtroom in 2009. So the prosecutor here is questioning the detective on the case who's testifying on behalf of the client. Prosecutor says, let me focus you particularly on a situation involving a penetration with his nose or nasal area of his face, detective. Well, he'd pay her $20 a song for a lap dance. On this occasion, she was topless, began grinding, dancing, trying to arouse his penis. At one point, she exposed her vagina to him and placed it on the tip of his nose and began grinding on his nose with her vagina. Prosecutor. Did the confidential informant indicate that his nose actually went inside or penetrated her vaginal area? Detective. Yes, it did. So we can all take a moment to let that sort of sink in, right? I hope that you are all aware that HIV is not transmitted nasally, right? That is not how it works, folks. I hope we're all on the same page, right, with just that sort of basic fact. But under Michigan law, it does not matter. All you have to show is that a sexual penetration took place in order to press charges, whether that penetration posed a risk or not. That man was in no danger of contracting HIV from her actions. And in fact, I don't actually think that this transpired. I have not gotten many lap dances in my time. I don't know about y'all. This is not usually something that I think is on the menu uh, that I'm familiar with. Uh, I think it's instead a trumped up charge, right? But nonetheless, it sort of illustrates the farsity of the law. Have 
no effect. I could take a vial of HIV and pour it all over my body, and if I don't have any cuts or anything, there is literally no risk of transmission. It's not possible. It has to get inside you. So in fact, transmission was rarely alleged in these cases. In the cases reviewed for this project, hundreds of cases, less than 10% of defendants were accused of transmitting the disease to their partners. Despite this fact, prosecutors and judges routinely compared HIV to a death sentence and defendants to murderers. Yet in my research analyzing, as I said, hundreds of cases for this book, I only ever uncovered one death associated with a criminal case. Also nearby, William K., 52-year-old white gay man living in Allegan County, uh, again, not far from here in Muskegon, 2004, convicted. He was accused of not disclosing his HIV status to a casual male, male partner before engaging in receptive anal intercourse one time. At sentencing, William told the court that he was unaware that the law existed and that he thought he was protecting his partner by using a condom. Unsympathetic, the judge scolded William at sentencing, quote, it never occurred to you that you might kill the man? William said he thought he followed the law because he insisted on the condom. As in so many of these proceedings brought under Michigan's law and other laws like it, the judge slammed William for exposing his partner to, quote, a huge risk, ignoring the contemporary research that, might have tur that the judge might have turned to to estimate the odds of transmission from a receptive to insertive anal sex partner while using a condom. What would that risk amount to, right? What are we talking about here? What kind of figures? For a one-time sexual encounter between an HIV-positive man and an HIV-negative man having anal intercourse, roughly 1 in 12,820, using estimates published in 1999, so well available to the, to the judge at the time. Uh, nonetheless, in August 2004, the judge sentenced him to 24 months probation. So let's step back just a moment from those figures. So one in 12,820, it's, it's such a large number, it's hard to wrap your head around. So let's imagine a hypothetical scenario where a couple that had anal sex every day, every single day for an entire year, how many years would it take for us to estimate one transmission between those partners? 35 years, right? They could have sex every day for a year, for 35 years, and you wouldn't expect more than one transmission during that time. Is that really a huge risk, right? Do we, do, is that the kind of risk we would uh, want to send someone to, to prison potentially for? Okay, back to William's story. So he began his probation term of 24 months, but about a year into his sentence, he was charged with two counts of violating that probation. His alleged violation was, quote, the first would be count one, violation of term number three, and the defendant failed to provide a truthful report to his probation officer, specifically by lying about his attendance at treatment. Count two, violation of term 3.3, in that the defendant failed to attend his specified treatment as directed. Let me translate that for you. In short, William was arrested for not seeing his therapist and faced prison time as a result. So while a, such a small infraction, not going to your therapist, would seem petty to most of us not familiar with the criminal justice system, technical violations like this violate people on their probation all the time. This is not unique to HIV. People go to prison for not going to their doctor, for missing curfew, all kinds of technical violations that are not crimes in and of themselves, but they nonetheless violate the terms of probation. On August 5th, 2005, William was arraigned on those probation violation charges. He was non-responsive when the judge asked him a question and then later complained that he did not feel well and asked to sit throughout the proceedings. The pr prosecutor successfully argued for a significant bond set at $10,000 to keep William behind bars while awaiting a hearing on the charges. Again, not unique to this story. People sit for months, even years, awaiting trial um, around the country. At the hearing, William represented himself and appeared ready to plead guilty to the second count, 
but he explained he had trouble getting in touch with his therapist. The judge appeared frustrated with Williams hedging on pleading guilty, telling him repeatedly, I don't care. William, for his part, appeared confused as to what exactly was happening and what his legal options were. Judge talking to him, well, let's put it this way, William. Either you missed treatments that you were supposed to go to or you didn't. You can either plead guilty or not guilty. I don't care which way you go. I just need to have a definitive statement. Defendant, why didn't they check with him, the therapist? Look, I can't answer you, the judge says. I don't know anything about it, period. I don't know whether you went, whether you didn't go. All I can, either take your, all I can do is either take your plea and you admit that you didn't go, or we have a hearing. And I'll decide if they have evidence that says you didn't go. You've got your choice. What do you want to do? Defendant says, can I, change, uh, can I change the hearing later or not? No, the judge says. If you're having a hearing, you're here today for a hearing. We're either going to have that hearing or you're going to enter a plea, one or the other. I don't care which. Defendant, can I plea bargain something? Judge, talk to the prosecutor. Go ahead, talk to him. I don't care. After a repeated back and forth with the prosecutor, they failed to come to an agreement, and William declared that he wished to contest the charges against him. Although he could have given, the judge could have given William uh, a continuance, allowing him time to sort of sort out his legal issues, to get representation, he had no lawyer with him. The judge immediately opened the hearing against him and called William's probation officer to the stand. After the prosecutor briefly questioned the officer, the judge then turned back to William to present his defense. The judge, William, it's your opportunity to present testimony or evidence. Do you have any testimony to present? The defendant responds, I guess I'm just a little confused. Judge, well, you said you wanted a hearing. You weren't going to plead. We're having the hearing. You have testimony against you. The prosecutors put his case in. The defendant says, I'm sorry. The other gentleman told me that we would have a trial and do all that kind of stuff. Judge, we're having a trial right now. I don't care what he told you. We're not having it month, next month, we're having it today. William continued by explaining that while he did miss some sessions, he was sick and it was difficult to get a hold of his counselor. The judge promptly found William guilty of violating his probation. Quote, now I don't know that you did so because you're a mean, evil person. You probably were sick, but it doesn't matter. You violated the terms of your probation and you're guilty as charged. Bond was continued at $10,000, leaving William behind bars as he awaited his September 16, 2005 sentencing. William would not appear in court again, however. He died 11 days later on August 29th, just days before he was to be sentenced for not seeing his therapist. When I first discovered William's case, I didn't know what had happened. I thought maybe the court reporter just forgot to include the sentencing hearing in the file she sent to me. So I searched Google and ultimately found his obituary, which did not mention the cause of death or any explanation for what had happened. So I ultimately uh, ordered his death certificate to better understand, to understand what had exactly happened. So according to those official records, William was pronounced dead upon arrival at a regional hospital the official cause of death listed on his death certificate is cryptococcal meningitis, a fungal infection associated with untreated HIV, and quote, advanced AIDS or HIV. Although a medical doctor would say that William died of AIDS-related complications, sociologically speaking, the legal proceedings against him seem at the very least to be a comp complicating factor. Although the judge accused William of potentially killing his partner, it was William who would, not, would ultimately not survive the allegations. William's case tragically illustrates how things can go terribly wrong for people living with HIV when the system fails, and it clearly failed him. While probation is supposed to be a lighter sentence meant to inspire rehabilitation in the convicted defendant, clearly there was no rehabilitative spirit to be found for William. The case, this case raises a larger question. What are we trying to accomplish here? What is the goal of punishing people so severely? Do we just want to punish them for punishment's sake? 
Or do we hope that the defendant can one day reintegrate back into society? After reviewing many cases, hundreds of cases, it seems most times punishment is meted out to defendants under HIV laws with the intention solely as a way to exact a kind of moral revenge on the defendant, often driven by accusers who overdramatize the harm done to them. In some states, like Tennessee and Louisiana, the possibility of reintegrating into society is made even more challenging by the fact that defendants convicted under those states' HIV laws are required to register as sex offenders for life. That's Robert Suttle, convicted under Louisiana's felony HIV law after his boyfriend, who Robert says knew of his HIV status, turned him into the police. His driver's license, you can see here, is stamped in red with sex offender in all caps. He will forever be branded with the mark of that stigma. Is that justice? The stigma inherent in many of these cases is not hard to see. In many cases, accusers made wildly inaccurate claims about the possibility of contracting HIV, for example. If you ever go and get an HIV test, if you haven't had one yet, I encourage you to do so. A doctor or a nurse will explain to you that most HIV tests don't actually look for the virus, but instead for antibodies that your body produces in response to the virus. In, so um, uh, a, a newly infected person may not produce those antibodies for several weeks after exposure. So this is what's called the window period, is that you have to wait some number of weeks before an HIV test gives you a definitive answer. Are you positive or negative? It can last up to six months, but the CDC estimates that 95% of cases uh, can be diagnosed after three months after the exposure. In case after case after case, accusers testified before the court at sentencing, claiming that they may have to wait years or even decades to know if they had contracted HIV. For example, in Montcalm County in Michigan, official sentence, uh, official sentence Gerald C., a 32-year-old white man, eight months, eight months after the last sexual encounter alleged by four women. The prosecutor argued that, quote, they're not out of the woods yet. They still may come down with this fatal disease. The judge agreed, sentencing Gerald to 30 to 48 months in prison. Quote, you have potentially given four others a life sentence, and that's something this court cannot overlook. In Tennessee courtrooms, some victims made dramatic claims about the possibility of becoming infected years after having sex with a defendant. Tennessee law expressly allows crime victims to testify at sentencing to provide what's known as impact testimony, to testify on behalf of what the impact of the crime was on them. The inaccurate testimony of victims who had no medical training or expertise has affected sentencing in several cases. For example, Antonio pled guilty in 2004 in Davidson County uh, in Tennessee to charges that he failed to disclose to a woman uh, with whom he had had an ongoing sexual relationship. Antonio was sentenced eight months after their relationship ended, long after the window period would have la lapsed. The woman testified at court, the accuser testified at court, that she had so far tested negative, but she added, quote, I can show up positive anywhere up to 10 years later, a claim that the prosecutor then picked up on. The argument appeared to hold sway over the judge, who ruled that Antonio would serve 10 years probation, by far the longest probation term handed down in any case analyzed for this study. Scott B., 36-year-old white man, pled guilty in 2007 in front of the same judge in Davidson County, Judge Cheryl Blackburn, who had previously heard Antonio's case. Judge Scott admitted having sex twice with a woman he was dating without disclosing his status. Four months after their sexual encounter uh, contact ended, the woman took the stand at Scott's sentencing to claim that she would not never know whether or not Scott had infected her. She said, I just got done with my three-month test. I have a six-month test. I think I even have a five-year test if the two-year test comes back negative. The prosecutor then asked, followed up, and asked her whether she would ever know if she had been infected. 
She said, well, I mean, there's never a time, any time, because people have showed up like 10, 15, 12 years later with it, a statement that is patently false. She concluded her testimony by imploring the judge to hand down the maximum sentence. Quote, right now my tests have come back negative, but that's not saying they're always going to come back negative. And three years, the maximum sentence, is not worth the value of a life. The prosecutor argued that the woman's anxiety should render Scott ineligible for diversion, in which case he'd be put on probation, and after a term, that probation would be, uh, that, that charge would be discharged if he, if he didn't violate his probation. The prosecutor said uh, he, should not be ruled, he should be ruled not ineligible for that diversion. Uh, the best case scenario, he says, is a lifetime of uncertainty for her. Judge agreed with the prosecutor, denying Scott both diversion and probation and sentencing him to the maximum three years in prison for, quote, destroying someone's life. So in the book, I analyze hundreds of cases like these. I find that the average prison sentence in these cases handed down against defendants living with HIV is nine years in prison. Given that few defendants are ever accused of actually transmitting the disease, the only measurable harm identified in most cases is psychological duress, rooted in many cases in an irrational fear of contracting HIV. Is causing a sexual partner anxiety, oftentimes unwarranted anxiety, irrational anxiety, a crime worth nine years in prison? Cases like those that I've discussed here today and countless others across the U.S. are finally beginning to ignite a serious conversation about criminal justice reform for HIV. But I wanted to close here by just highlighting that I think we're at a precipitous moment where we could go one of two ways. We're at a crossroads. It's not clear where the future is going to take us. So on the West Coast, we have states like California and Colorado, you can see illustrated here in blue, who have moved in the past few years to repeal their HIV felony laws. These were huge wins for activists. It is very difficult to get a lawmaker to repeal a criminal law. They very much do not want to look soft on crime. They're thinking of the next election cycle. That's why philosophers say that the criminal law should be a method of last resort because they are painstakingly hard to get off the books once they're there. That activists then in, in California and Colorado won a repeal is a significant victory and should not really be understated as a, as a policy move. In the Midwest and the South, maybe not surprising to some of us, states are moving in a different direction. Instead of repealing those laws, states uh, such as Iowa and Tennessee, you can see here illustrated in red, have in recent years, ex in recent years they've expanded their HIV laws to include other diseases. Hepatitis in Tennessee and hepatitis, meningitis, tuberculosis, and several other infections in Iowa. Now Iowa's case I think is particularly troubling because HIV and LGBT activists, gay and lesbian activists, celebrated this policy change. Why celebrate an expansion to other diseases? Because for the advocates, it meant not discriminating against HIV anymore, right? We're punishing everybody, not singling out HIV. I think that's a short-sighted victory. I know local advocates in Iowa, some of which I know, felt strongly at the time that that was the best they were going to get out of that legislature. And indeed, in the most eg least egregious ke cases, the penalties were reduced. You cannot go to prison for 25 years in Iowa anymore for having sex with a condom if you're living with HIV, as was the case before this, this law was changed. That's progress to be sure, but I'm quite skeptical of efforts to expand the laws to include other diseases. So what does the future entail? Do we punish more diseases, or do we move towards decriminalization like California and Colorado? For myself, I would say I vote for the latter. Based on my years of research and reading and analyzing criminal cases against defendants living with HIV, I can confidently say that I did not feel that punishment, and certainly not incarceration for decades, 
was warranted in most cases. So what about that boogeyman? Right? Back to the boogeyman. I'm not so radical as to say that there's nothing that should be done if you have a case involving someone who is willfully, intentionally trying to expose and infect their partners. I think authorities do have a responsibility to intervene in such a case. That may involve a public health intervention first, but in a few cases it may require criminal charges. But we do not need HIV-specific criminal laws to punish those boogeymen. We can deal with them using general assault or endangerment statutes. When we try to deal with those cases by creating new criminal laws, the result is in staring a much broader group of people than we could ever anticipate. Science of disease changes very quickly. The law stays the same. It lags behind. It's hard to keep the law to keep up with disease. The two, I would argue, are, are not compatible for that reason. Disease deserves treatment, not punishment. And our continued attempts to deal with it through the criminal justice system, I would argue, are almost certainly counterproductive, and in many cases, unethical. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you.